Good morning. My name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elville and Associates, and welcome to our webinar, Estate Planning for Business Owners, with our presenter, Managing Principal and Senior Estate Planning Attorney, Olivia holcomb Bulky with Elville and Associates. Briefly, the way this will work today is you as the attendees are on mute. However, there is a questions panel on your screen where you can ask questions, interact with me throughout the presentation, and we will pause to field those questions throughout the presentation and at the end as well. For any certified financial planners, CPAs, or other professionals on the webinar, um, you may receive 1.5 continuing education credits for being here today. If I don't already have it for my records and reporting requirements, please email me your board ID. And also for CFPs only, the last four digits of your social security number. Everyone will also receive a post webinar feedback email right after the presentation. And I do ask that you please take just a couple minutes to fill out this simple survey that's gonna offer us valuable feedback about the presentation. It'll also give you the chance to share some ideas about future presentations that you might like us to offer, and also have the opportunity to request a time for a consultation with Olivia to discuss your planning needs if you choose, um, either now or in the foreseeable future. And we look forward to being a resource to you. And for me, there's nobody better um, to give you got to give you guidance for your planning through uh, Olivia. Um, my family and I have uh, worked with Olivia over the past few years uh, for our planning needs and uh, just found her to be just a wonderful resource and an even better person. So um, with that being said, um, just a little bit about the firm um, and a little bit about Olivia and we're going to jump right into it. Um, we were founded in 2010 in Columbia um, by President and Managing Principal Stephen Elville. We have a number of different practice areas here at Elville and Associates, including estate and special needs planning, elder law and elder care planning, estate and trust administration, business and succession planning, asset protection and tax planning, as well as a guardianship and litigation practice. We have seven attorneys, 12 staff members in five different locations, and we're coming to you live from the Columbia location today. Our mission, as it always has been and always will be, is to provide practical solutions to our clients' needs through counseling, education, and the use of superior legal technical knowledge. And we do offer a lot of education here at the firm. We offer that through our planning processes with our clients. We offer well over 100 educational workshops and webinars in the communities that we serve each year. We're doing three this week. And also by way of our accredited client care program, we're the only firm in Maryland with the accredited client care program through the Client Care Academy in Boston, Massachusetts. And we also work with the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion with every client every day here at the firm. So you should expect nothing less from us anytime that you work with us here at Elville and Associates. Uh, a little bit about Olivia before we jump into it. Olivia, I've had the pleasure to work with Olivia for many, many years now. Um, she is the um, managing principal and senior estate planning attorney with Elville and Associates. Um, her work is centered in estate planning, elder law, estate and trust administration, special needs planning and asset protection, along with business law. She's a seasoned speaker, presenting at many workshops and events throughout the year. Um, named to the Maryland Rising Stars list by Maryland Super Lawyers in 2017, uh, 10 best in client satisfaction and estate planning by the Maryland Institute of Legal Counsel. Um, we're very proud of Olivia's um, volunteer work here at the firm, um, a board member for the Women's Law Center of Maryland, uh, chair of the Judicial Selections Committee for the Women's Law Center, um, also a volunteer attorney for the Maryland Volunteer Lawyers Service, um, where she is the founding member of the MBLS's Community Advocacy Network, um, also volunteer of the month for that um, network in May 2019, and she also provides training to a lot of attorneys um, on how to um, draft advanced directives, powers of attorney, wills, and deeds. So she is a very busy person, and we're very happy to have her take some time out of her day to provide some education for uh, us here um, on estate planning for business owners. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. I have a brief poll, um, and that poll today is, what brings you to today's webinar? And the question, uh, the answers to those questions, and choose the best one that suits your situation, please. We have an idea of what brings you here today is 
Uh, one, I did my estate planning before I owned my business. Two, my business has changed and I may need to update my planning. Three, my business is aligned well with my estate planning. I'm here to learn. Or four, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So you can just take a minute to select your best answer and we'll get an idea of who's come to join us today. And we've got about 70% having submitted their responses. Just take a few more seconds. Okay, so uh, with most of the responses cast, um, it appears we have 10% saying I did my estate planning before I owned my business. Another 10% saying my business has changed and I may need to update my planning. Another 10% saying my business is aligned well with my estate plan, I'm here to learn. And another 70% saying I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. Okay, very good. Well, welcome everybody. And I will turn it over to Olivia. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to change presenter modes here. And in a minute, you'll be able to see Olivia's screen and the presentation. After I close that poll. Olivia, do you see the um, option to share your screen? Let's see, Jeff. Um... I do not see it just yet. Okay, Here it is. there we go. Okay, are you able right. to? Very good. All right, well, hello everyone, good morning. And thank you for that introduction, Jeff. I am Olivia holcomb Bolke, and the topic that I will be covering today is estate planning for business owners. How is it that estate planning and business ownership actually overlap? And something that I say regularly to people is that having a plan is actually planning for the worst case scenario, which is of course incapacity and ultimately death, which is an unavoidable reality for all of us, but then living toward the best. So by having a plan in place, you are prepared for the worst, and then you live your life hoping that it will go according to your ideal plan, which is that you will be able to retire and enjoy retirement and not face incapacity, and that then at death, everything will be structured to flow according to your preferences without any issues. So by having a plan, you have prepared yourself for the worst, and then you are able, I always hope, to actually live toward the best. I'm going to start talking about estate planning um, in general. And as I go over estate planning in general and what fundamental documents are meant when we say estate planning, I'm going to interweave elements of how those estate planning documents actually apply to business ownership and business interests. And then I'm going to wrap up by talking a bit about more extensive planning that can be done in terms of business ownership with regard to a business succession plan. But the starting point is a brief review of what estate planning means. So many people think of estate planning as what happens to my stuff when I die, but it actually covers much more than that. It covers planning for the care of your health and your property, including business interests, in the event that you are still alive but become incapacitated. And it also involves planning for the disposition of your property at death and for the ultimate protection and care of those who are dependent upon you. Incapacity planning, when we're talking about incapacity planning, 
what we're really talking about is avoiding adult guardianship. Many people are familiar with guardianship in terms of minors, but there is also adult guardianship, which is something that takes place when an adult who had mental capacity loses it, did not ever sign the necessary documents giving another person the authority to act on their behalf with regard to their health and their property and their assets. And now, unfortunately, that now incapacitated adult could be subject to guardianship, which is a court-ordered, court-supervised process where a court-ordered guardian is appointed to be in charge of the incapacitated adult's health and property and finances. And that court-ordered, court-appointed guardian must check in with the court regularly. This process is embarrassing and it is expensive. So it is not something that any adult who does have capacity ever wants to happen to them. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about incapacity planning, is making sure that you have the appropriate documents in place to protect you against the risk that you would ever be subject to court-ordered guardianship. And those documents are the advanced medical directive, which I'll talk about in more detail, and financial powers of attorney. So the advanced medical directive is the document in Maryland that deals with your health care decision making. In some states and some jurisdictions, this is known as a health care power of attorney. Maryland identifies it as an advanced medical directive. It is a document that allows you to designate an agent which would be the person who has the authority to speak to the doctors and healthcare providers on your behalf and to make decisions about your healthcare if need be. Of course, we always recommend that you designate more than one agent. So if you are going to go through the exercise of putting these documents together, we want to make sure that they will last and that they will be effective for your needs if and when necessary. And you never want to limit it to only one agent because what if that person is deceased or incapacitated? So always a good idea to name at least one backup agent, if not more. This document also allows you to actually give specific instructions about healthcare treatment that you do want to receive or that you do not want to receive in certain end of life situations. And that is what is actually known as the living will. This document also allows you to talk about your organ donation preferences, your final arrangement preferences, and to go into detail about more personal preferences, such as if you're ever in an end of life situation and uh, perhaps in a facility or no longer able to communicate would you want to be able to listen to classical music or be near a window if possible? All sorts of things that you may know quite well about yourself and your preferences, but the person who may be handling things for you may have no awareness of that. So this gives you the opportunity to put all of that into writing. People regularly ask me, does this document cover do not resuscitate orders? The answer is no. In Maryland, that is actually covered by a document called the MOLST. That stands for Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. If you work with me or any of the attorneys at Elville and Associates, we can provide you with more information about the MOLST form, but it is something that's actually completed and signed by a doctor. It is a medical order, but it's important for you to be aware of its application in the state of Maryland, how it works, when it works, and what it is that you can do to anticipate a time where it might be applicable to you. And primarily, I always recommend that people discuss this in more detail 
with their primary care physician. So that was health care. Then there are the financial powers of attorney. We utilize two forms as power of attorney for finance. And the reason that we utilize two forms is because the primary form that we use is called the Maryland Statutory Form Personal Financial Power of Attorney. This document was actually written by the Maryland legislature. And in Maryland law, it says that if you use this standardized form and you do not change any of the language, other than, of course, the names of the people to whom you are giving power and some limited customization, specifically with regard to at what point the document is effective, but as long as you don't change anything else about the document, Maryland law says it is mandatory that this power of attorney document be accepted by financial institutions. So it's extremely powerful, and that's why we always want to start by using this power of attorney. The power of attorney is a document that deals with assets, and the purpose of it is for you to designate an agent. Again, I always recommend that you designate at least one backup, if not more, but the purpose and the power that the agents will have is with regard to your assets, and the idea is that they would be able to act on your behalf with regard to your assets. Now, this is intended to protect you in the event that you become incapacitated. You have designated another person to have the authority to step in and access your money to be able to pay your bills and to be able to make investment decisions if need be or sign tax returns for you. But the reality is that a power of attorney can actually be effective even before you become incapacitated. And in fact, that is what it, the default provision is under the law, that it is effective upon signing. And that's typically a big source of discussion with my clients because most people are not keen on the idea that their power of attorney would have power immediately. There are reasons that this can be useful. It is not meant to give away your own power over your assets, but it is something that's worth discussing with me or your estate planning attorney about the utility of it and whether or not that's appropriate for you. And that is something that can be customized. The reason that we utilize a second power of attorney document which is titled the General Durable Financial Power of Attorney. That is simply the title that's used on, on the document that we prepare. Both documents are general powers of attorney and both documents are durable powers of attorney. And of course they are both financial. But the reason that we use this secondary power of attorney document is to supplement the Maryland statutory form. The Maryland statutory form has the power of mandatory acceptance by financial institutions. So it is always step one because it is mandatorily accepted, but it does not actually cover everything. The legislature covered most powers and most types of assets, but they did not cover everything. And that is why we recommend, and for our clients, we use this secondary supplemental power of attorney to go hand in hand with the Maryland statutory form to cover those additional powers, including powers to operate business interests. So it is in the supplemental power of attorney that we go into more detail about the power to step in and manage LLC interests or other types of business interests, corporate interests, other types of business interests that is covered in that supplemental power of attorney document. So here's where I have the first example of how a business owner's business interests may be covered in estate planning documents. 
And then we have after death planning. So the advanced directive and the financial powers of attorney are applicable during life. And they again are meant to protect one if incapacitated against the risk of court ordered guardianship. After death planning in a fundamental way, the, the fundamental estate plan pivots on one of two options. There are many additional options available depending on all of the client's circumstances and interests and goals and concerns. But the fundamental documents that are typically applicable for most clients are to utilize either a last will and testament or a revocable living trust. A last will and testament is a document that dictates what you want to happen to your assets at death and who you want to handle the distribution of those assets in accordance with the terms of your will. What comes as a surprise frequently to people is that a will is only effective over probate assets and therefore it is subject to probate. So many times I hear people say, I have a will, therefore I will, my, my, my death will not lead to probate. When I die, my will says what happens and there will be no probate. That is not true. Probate is a process that takes place with regard to assets on which there is no living owner and no designated beneficiary. If there is an asset of that type, it must go through probate in order to end up in the hands and ownership of the person who inherits it. If there is no will, that process is um, uh, directed according to what the laws of Maryland say. If there is a will, then probate follows the terms of what the will says, as long as the will uh, is not challenged successfully. Probate is subject to public oversight. The probate process is quite basically opening the probate estate with the Register of Wills Office, filing an inventory of assets within three months, having the opportunity for creditors to file valid claims, and providing regular accountings to the probate court regarding all incomes, expenses, debts, taxes, an accounting of what has gone on in the estate. On average, we do find that the cost of probate on average ends up being anywhere from four to 7% of the size of the estate, typically more on the 4% side. Here again, this is relevant with regard to business interests. Now, something that I should have said previously is the starting point with business interests and what will happen in the event of incapacity or death. The starting point is, are there business documents in place on point? So is there some sort of business document or corporate document that covers what will happen in the event the business interest owner becomes incapacitated or dies. So that is always the starting point. But beyond that, in terms of which estate planning documents may deal with business interests and may cover business interests, it's the financial powers of attorney. And if someone utilizes a last will and testament as their estate plan, the last will and testament can also deal with the business interests and basically designating where a business owner or the owner of a business interest wants that business interest to go at death. The alternative to using a last will and testament, again, in a fundamental way, there are many other options, but the typical choice for most people is between utilizing a last will and testament versus ut utilizing what's called a revocable living trust. So whereas a last will and testament is something that only has effect in the probate process, a revocable living trust avoids probate. 
Now, the reason that I have an asterisk with regard to avoidance of probate is because it only works if the revocable living trust is done in such a way that not only is there a document called a revocable living trust, but all of your assets have also been properly addressed and structured in terms of the trust plan. A revocable living trust is a document, just like a will is a document. And a revocable living trust also sets forth what you want to happen to your estate when you die and who you want to handle it. But the difference between the revocable living trust and the will is that after you've signed the revocable trust, then there's a second piece of the process, which is called funding or asset alignment. And this is where we take all of your assets, including any business interests that you have, and we make sure that all of those assets are structured properly to flow according to the trust terms. A revocable trust is not, it does not provide tax savings and it does not provide asset protection. So that's an important thing to always emphasize. A revocable living trust avoids probate. It does not provide creditor protection to you during life and it does not provide tax savings. On average, we do find that the cost of trust administration when someone utilizes a revocable living trust for their estate planning document, on average, that ends up being more like 1% to 2%, usually closer to the 2% range. So summarizing which estate planning documents actually address business interests. So again, the starting point is to look and see, are there corporate documents in place that dictate what happens in the event a business owner or business interest owner becomes incapacitated or dies? Because that's the starting point to then direct us to know what estate planning documents can be used to apply to the business interest and how. It also depends on the type of estate plan that someone utilizes. So whether it's a will-based estate plan or a trust-based estate plan will also impact which documents are actually used to provide for what happens with the business interest in the event of incapacity and what happens with the business interest in the event of death. And then the decision is made by us in consultation with the client and after reviewing the business documents, if there are any, then the decision is made also based upon the type of business interest as to whether it is something that involves a lifetime assignment or transfer. That is really only applicable if we're doing a revocable trust-based estate plan. Because again, with the revocable trust, it's a matter of doing lifetime transfers or assignments of certain assets to the revocable trust while you are still alive versus what happens after death with that particular asset. A revocable trust is something where we are able to do lifetime transfers or assignments to the revocable trust so that then at your death, those assets are already owned or controlled by the revocable trust and are already set up to then follow the terms of what the trust says after death. So it's only when you do a revocable trust that we even have the option of doing any sort of lifetime assignment or transfer of your business interest. If you do a will, that's just not even an option because that only um, is implicated at your death but it also depends upon the type of business interest and what the corporate documents say. And so to be clear, depending upon all of that, it may be that a lifetime business interest owners, lifetime interests are controlled by their financial power of attorney documents, 
or it may be if they've done a revocable trust, their lifetime business interest ownership is controlled by the revocable living trust. Or depending on all of the circumstances, it may be something that only takes place after death, that while you are living, you have full ownership and control of the business interest, and it's only something that you've set up documents that control what happens to it after your death. So that's a rather complicated thing to talk about, but the point is taking into account what the business documents say, taking into account the type of estate plan that a client wants to do, and talking to an attorney who is able to actually understand all of that, how they work together, and counsel the client on what is the best mechanism to make sure that your business interests are covered by the estate plan that you've put into place. When we're talking about the type of business that may be a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC, and there is no desire necessarily for the business to continue. In that case, basic estate planning documents are sufficient. Not much more needs to be done in a, a more complicated planning, business planning type of way. But when we're talking about anything that's more complicated than that, then it's really a good idea to introduce the idea of business succession planning. So business succession planning, as it sounds, is the idea of making sure that there is some sort of plan in place for the business to continue in the event you become incapacitated and ultimately die. So this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good introductory list of the types of businesses where business succession planning really is necessary and wise. So if it's a business where there are complex processes, which means that if you are no longer able to do so, it would be very complicated for someone to step in and know what to do and know how to handle it if there isn't some sort of succession plan in place so that it's planned for ahead of time. Or if it's a business where there are multiple employees, so there are, there are multiple people who are reliant upon this business continuing. Similarly, if there are repeat clients or ongoing processes where there would be um, a major disruption to clients who depend upon the repeat use of the business or maybe what the clients have hired the business to do, it's in the midst of happening. That process is ongoing. It's in the middle of it. And if something were to happen to you and there were no way for the business to continue, that would be very disruptive to those clients and to those processes. Or if you simply have a desire that there will be some sort of succession or continuation of the business, even if you are not able to be a part of it. In all of these circumstances, what this is telling you is it's important for you to have a business succession plan in place. Common types of business succession typically fall within these different options. So sometimes a business succession plan may involve the co-owners of the business or the partners, the other partners of the business, to actually buy out the interest of the incapacitated or deceased owner or partner. Or it may be that the business succession plan is set up such that the business interest will pass to an heir or family member or a beneficiary or legatee. It may be that it's structured such that a key employee will buy out the interest of the business owner who becomes incapacitated or dies. It may be that it's structured so that there will be a sale to an outside party in the event that that becomes relevant or that the company or business itself actually buys out the interest. These are all options. These all depend upon your particular type of business, your particular uh, preference and goal for what will happen. 
all of these are options to be discussed, taking into account all of those circumstances. But the point is that in order for any of these to happen according to plan, there needs to actually be a business succession plan in place. A buy and sell agreement, which is sometimes known as a buyout agreement or a business will or a business prenup, this is actually a contract, so a written document that stipulates how a business owner's ownership interest will be handled in the event of the business owner's death or departure from the business, for example, due to incapacity. So a buy and sell agreement is a pivotal piece of a business succession plan. When talking about why plan, so this is relevant not only with regard to business interests, business succession planning, but also generally speaking with regard to why it's so important to have an estate plan, a written estate plan. It's in order to minimize the headache for everyone who may be involved. If there's a plan in place, then it's a matter of simply following the plan, which is much less headache and much less complication than struggling to figure out what's what and how it needs to happen and what's allowed, all which are necessary in the event there is nothing in writing, no written plan. This also means that you are ensuring some level of certainty, not only for your employees and clients, but also for your family members or the people who will be handling things on your behalf in the event you become incapacitated and after death. Having a plan also facilitates that all of this will be handled in a smooth and timely ma manner. Having a business succession plan and a buy and sell agreement also limits the risk that there would be an external takeover or the need to liquidate business assets because you have a plan in place ahead of time. And having a plan, whether it's a business succession plan or an estate plan in general, allows you to actually achieve special purposes or personal preferences that you may have, which will not necessarily be accomplished without a plan in place. So the point of all of this, as has been made very clear, I am sure, is that it is so important to make a plan and put it into writing. And it is only by doing so that you will be prepared for whatever may come and that you will have at least some guarantee or some confidence that things will go according to how you want them to go. And that's the end of my presentation. Jeff, do we have any questions? Thanks, Olivia. Um, we do have a question. Um, the question is, uh, should disability income insurance, disability buyout insurance, and business overhead disability insurance be part of any business owner's planning? So thank you, Jeff, and that is an excellent question. I think that the starting point of my answer is to say there is almost never a blanket answer. And so really it depends upon the type of business and the size and the number of people involved and all of that sort of thing. So depending on those circumstances, the answer could certainly be yes. Okay, very good. Um, so um, right now, no more questions, but now certainly would be your time to put those questions in for Olivia, um, if you have them. Um, I'm gonna jump back on camera here for just a minute and say thank you to Olivia for a job well done and give you a virtual hand. Um, so we appreciate your time and expertise in that area. Um, please go ahead and pose any questions that you have right now as I um, give some closing comments. Um, so um, 
this was a new presentation for us today. And um, I do want to mention that we do have another presentation tomorrow by um, Mr. Stephen Elville, our president and uh, managing principal here at the firm, uh, an estate and trust um, administration uh, webinar, which is a, a quarterly event. It's a very popular um, uh, event here at the firm. We have a, a lot of people signed up for it. Um, so he does a great job with that. So there's still time to sign up, even though it's tomorrow. Um, it looks like we have another question. Um, I'll also say we have a couple of new events coming up um, over the next couple of uh, months that we're looking forward to. Um, Ellen Platt, um, a, a certified aging life care manager, is going to be talking about COVID-19 and mental health, um, a very timely topic. Uh, we're looking forward to that um, in November. And also, Steve has created a new presentation um, titled Intentionalism in, in in estate planning, achieving perfection for your legacy. Um, he is working hard on that new presentation and uh, that will be one that you definitely won't wanna miss. So um, we look forward to those presentations among others that we have coming up. And uh, it looks like we have another question. And that question is, should even a sole proprietor create a plan? I have a question. It's a very good question. Um, so not being entirely clear on which type of plan, but my answer to that question would be, should even a sole proprietor have an estate plan and estate planning documents? The answer is yes. That I can give a blanket answer to. Every adult should have estate planning documents in place because Estate planning is not just about death, it's about incapacity. And the reality is death can happen to even young people, but incapacity is also something that can happen really at any age. You can trip and fall and hit your head, have a traumatic brain injury. If you don't have estate planning documents in place, you're now subject to a court-ordered guardianship. So yes, every adult should have estate planning documents. Should a sole proprietor have business planning documents or business documents in place? This really depends upon their desire to have any sort of planned succession for that business. Um, so it depends upon their intentions with regard to what would happen with that business if they were to become incapacitated and at death. If there is no desire for continuation or succession of the business, then a business plan and a business succession plan is probably not necessary. Okay, very good. And at this point, doesn't appear we have any other questions. Um, so we uh, look forward to being a resource to you. Um, we thank our uh, clients and uh, people that are joining us for the first time for being on today and uh, for our advisor friends and uh, partners. Thank you for joining us. Um, if we hadn't gotten the chance to get together with you lately, um, let's uh, um, set a time to, to get together and reconnect um, by uh, either in person if you'd like uh, or by video. Uh, we look forward to that and uh, find some ways we can work together to, to be a resource and help each other's clients. Um, so um, if you wanna reach out to me or I can reach out to you and note that on the post webinar feedback, um, we can create a plan around that and uh, do that. So look forward to um, seeing you again soon and uh, we appreciate you being on today's webinar. So thanks again and have a great day. Take care. Thank you, bye.